I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Lily, who's going to talk a little bit about the history of her website. All right. Hi, everybody. I, my name is Lillian. Um, my domain is anomalily.net. And uh, this is a brief history of my website. So one of the things you just heard Tontak talk about is how we're finally kind of at the point where we are moving beyond people that can build the tools in the indie web from people who are just capable enough to use the tools in the indie web. So I like making websites. I've always loved making websites. I started making websites in the mid-90s, which if you can calculate based on how old I look, I was about nine years old. And uh, I was incredibly lucky to have uh, parents who taught me HTML and CSS. And I kept making websites. In the beginning, making websites was really beautiful because you didn't have to be a super good coder. Like, there wasn't a lot of coding involved. You learned HTML and CSS, and I learned PHP includes when they came out, and that was, like, life-changing. Um, but I just enjoyed the art of putting something together from text and making something pretty. Um, I had... Quite, I at one point hosted the uh, largest placebo fan site, which is a Britpop band from the 90s, the, long, the largest English language one. Um, but other than that, I had a blog where I whined like a teenager in the early 2000s. Um, I was very, very into making weird, pretty websites. And I was also very into the community that existed in the early web. Prior to social media really existing, there was a ton of early 2000s things that found ways to link community. So does anybody remember web rings? Yes. How freaking awesome were web rings, right? So I, I looked back, and one of the web rings I was in was people who don't regret go, not going to their prom. <laughs> who, who made that? And also, why would you feel the need to go look at everybody's personal websites that didn't regret not going to their prom? Um, but I, I also was very into things like... Um, uh, fan listings and adoptions. I adopted like most of Daniel Pinkwater's books. I, you know, these sort of things were kind of a beautiful relic of a very short moment in time from around 2000 to around 2005. And then something happened. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called Facebook. So my web presence continued in the early 2000s. Um, this is the CMS I'm using here is called Typo, which was based in Ruby on Rails, which I initially did to teach myself Ruby on Rails and quickly discovered I did not care. So I just had a CMS in a language I didn't know. Um, and uh, then I switched to WordPress. And this is what my website looked like. Hmm, I don't know maybe the year 2000, um, you'll notice that, or the year 2008, um, you'll notice that this was the beginning of making sure that I always had links out to the other social networks. And that was because this was kind of the point at which my website stopped being a my main face on the internet and the main place that I interacted with people on the internet. And it started just being kind of a landing page to link out to the places where other forms of community were on the internet. So despite the fact that I had a web page, 90% of the things on it were links to places like Tumblr and Twitter and Facebook and uh, bringing things in from my Flickr account. So I've had my own website for 20 years now. Um, I think slightly over 20 years. I am not a developer. <laughs> um, I go to tech meetups. I have been attending in Indie Web Summit, Indie Web Camp for a long time. I am not a developer. I can't emphasize this enough. I have, I know HTML and CSS, so I'm essentially a markup maven, but I have no ability to spend time building databases in PHP. I sort of like once PHP includes was the height of the internet technology, I stopped paying attention. Um, and most of the web books that I have, you know, are pre HTML5. So I am someone who's completely capable of using a CSS uh, or a CMS, but I am not someone who's good at building stuff. Um, but I still have a website. And the reason I have a website is because I have a lot of stuff I make. I am very firmly, so Amber Case made this um, great kind of demonstration of what the different indie web generations are going to be. And I am firmly in camp number two. I am generation number two. And this is people that don't build things 
in IndieWeb. We're not developers, but are completely comfortable setting things up in cPanel. We're comfortable having our own domain. We can install WordPress plugins, but we are beyond that not going to build stuff. And what kind of happened over the years is that despite having a website for 20 years, I used to post really regularly on my website. And then as Facebook took over, I posted less and less. Um, this is from archive.org. So you can kind of see that even, even Google stopped crawling my website for a while there um, because I wasn't regularly updating it. And in 2014, you see that I began implementing indie web technologies, and suddenly the posts and the crawls started happening more and more. But in 2010, I got one crawl from Google in the entire year. Um, and that's largely because the community on the internet and the people that I interacted with had all moved to Facebook and Flickr and Twitter and those places. And so there just wasn't a lot of incentive for me to post on my own website beyond having one up so that when you Googled me, I was the top result. But I wanted to search my own history. I am obsessed with data and being able to look back at things. And I make these huge reports every year uh, in zine form that I send out to people about my own personal data. And the most frustrating thing about Facebook was the amount of content that I was creating and I was putting out there that I just couldn't find again. Have you ever tried to like look for something that you know you posted in January of last year? It's miserable. It's, it's almost impossible to dig it up in the Facebook timeline. I also wanted to control the look and feel. Like, I'm not a graphic designer, but I am someone that's very visually motivated. And you can see from all of those terrible early designs of my website, I like to screw around and, and test the limits of technology. And you simply can't do that in a silo like Facebook and Twitter. I also wanted to be able to share what I was doing with the community without losing my work. Some of that is just losing my search history, but a large part of that is actually dealing with things like copyright and being able to document that I made it and not having it be created in a silo that then says, hey, you, you plagiarized that because we you know, heard that audio track and we think it's actually from a Beyonce song, which it's not, you know, but you don't have a lot of rights when you're creating the work initially in someone else's space. But if I'm posting things originally on my own website, at the very least I have a copy, but I also can, you know, potentially be able to prove that I originally did it on my own website. And I also wanted to be able to monetize the work that I'm doing in my own way. I didn't want to have to be reliant on ad networks like Google AdWords and things that I, essentially Facebook doesn't let you monetize at all. They just want you to pay them for advertising. Um, and things like YouTube essentially say, if we haven't deemed that something that you have made is worthy of monetizing, you're never going to see the money from it. So I'm putting work out there. I'm creating work. But I'm not able to monetize it if I leave it just on silos. So being able to make the choice about if and when I monetize and being able to make the choice about how I do that is one of the big reasons I wanted to have my own website. So. How does someone who is not a developer take her shit back from Facebook? <laughs> well, first up, I used WordPress. Um, why? Well, it's the most custom of the non-developer options. So technically, having a Tumblr can be kind of indie web. It's relatively challenging to implement, but you can have stuff on your own domain and have it on Tumblr. That's great. A ton of artists use Tumblrs, but it's challenging to kind of update the look and feel, and you're still kind of beholden to their algorithms. On the kind of other side is Squarespace, which makes these beautiful, sleek-looking websites that are updated for whatever the hot trend in websites is. Um, but Squarespace has a limit on what you can do as far as it, and it doesn't support my ability to push out to social networks in the same way. It's not optimized for that kind of behavior. WordPress is a good in-between. Someone that's capable of making some changes to C CSS and HTML, but generally doesn't want to screw around underneath the hood of their website, WordPress is a really good option. So when I started IndieWeb my website in 2014, there were really only a few plugins for IndieWeb. Um, and one of the big changes was that I think 2015, we finally made a, there was finally a package made of this is all the plugins that you might need for IndieWeb. Previously, you really had to go hunt and find in the documentation, like, OK, is there a web mentions plugin? Oh, no, it's being developed. No one's made it yet. Oh, OK, can I do Posse, blah, blah, blah. Um, now you can kind of install those all at once as part of the IndieWeb package. So these are some of the ones that I have. Um, one of the great examples, so I happen to know what most of these do, but you don't have to know what these do or like why you need custom taxonomy 
in order to be able to utilize these features if you are a non-developer. You can just install the, as long as you know how to install a plugin, you can get a lot of the functionality without really understanding why all these plugins are important. So I used Next Scripts, which is um, Snap Social Networks Auto Poster, and by having Snap installed, which isn't even explicitly part of the open web, but is just an incredibly handy tool, what it does is it means that I get, a, I get to send a unique URL for each of my blog posts out to the various social media networks. And I can have it auto do it, or I can actually customize. As you can see, I can choose like which image is gonna go out to Facebook or Twitter. I can change the excerpts. And the best part about that is that my website appears in the title on Facebook. So you're able to actually go through my Facebook timeline and see, hey, this came from anomalily.net. And the blog post looks pretty normal, with the exception of it has a link to the permanent place on Facebook where this exists. So I can see that it's on Facebook or Twitter. I don't have to put it on these other networks. I can make a regular blog post and not um, post on my own site and then syndicate to Facebook, but I can choose to do that and those links will auto be there because of Snap. This is particularly awesome because of that searching problem with Facebook, right? My WordPress is a lot more optimized to be able to search and link to other blog posts. It's almost impossible to link to other um, Word, uh, Facebook posts inside of the text of a Facebook post, but I'm able to do it from my own website and get to a permalink on Facebook. Incredibly helpful. And I use Bridgie for comments. Most people are probably familiar with Bridgie. The great thing about Bridgie is that it makes things look pretty and good, and it makes look, it look like I have an active community of commenters on my website, despite the fact that 99% of the people that interact with my website never come to it, right? Like, I hang out on my website. Most people don't. I don't have an active community of commenters, but I have hundreds of Facebook friends and people that follow me on Twitter that interact with my blog posts. And because of that, all of this comes back. So as you can see, um, I have Rob Anderson. He said, well said, Lily. It looks like a regular comment, except that it says via Facebook.com. Uh, Christy commented with a heart. That's actually a like from Facebook. Um, Frankie mentioned this article on Twitter.com. That will directly link to the tweet so you can see the permalink for the tweet. And, um, and then Will Norris commented on this article and he did it from his own website. And this is because Web Mentions is supported using the WordPress plugin. I also do some pesos, which is the slick IndieWeb word for post elsewhere syndicate own site. Um, a couple years ago, I did this project called Bifocal, which is a project where I took a picture of every single thing I bought for an entire year. I don't know why, I'm a crazy person. Um, and I kind of discovered about halfway through the project that the best tool for that was Instagram. I wasn't even active on Instagram. I didn't really have followers, but it was a quick way to snap a picture, edit it, make it look good, and then post it. I never had followers on Instagram. As you can see, I had two followers for my Bifocal account, but it just immediately syndicated to bifocal.anomaly.net and posted everything. This was not using technical indie web technologies. This was just using a WordPress theme called Photogram, <laughs> uh, trying to solve the problem of people want to use Instagram, but they also want it hosted on their own website. Um, it's just what I like to call accidental indie web. I also do all of my check-ins on Foursquare, and this is because I like a record of where I go, but now they all go to my website, so you can actually see all of my check-ins on my own website. I have written zero lines of code to do all of this. <laughs> you guys should not be clapping for me. You should be clapping for the awesome WordPress developers that have given up their time. I don't think anybody who's made any of the IndieWeb WordPress plugins is getting paid to do it, um, but they've made it possible for me <laughs> me, generation two, to be able to have all this stuff on my website. Thank you. So clapping for all of those awesome plugin developers. So this is kind of, you guys have gotten what I've gotten out of being generation two. Here are some, some of the kind of problems that come from being generation two. One, I don't really care about web standards. <laughs> um, just, I happen to know people who care about web standards, and so I kind of learn about them by osmosis, but I don't care, I'm never gonna care, and people like me are not gonna be the kind of people that are gonna geek out about the fact that we got a W3C recommendation. It's just not gonna happen. 
the next problem is that when things things break, where do I turn? So one of the problems that I'm having, which I hope to solve tomorrow, hat tip to anybody who can help me, um, is that my Foursquare check-ins have a broken Google Maps API. I'm not good enough to know what's going on with it. Um, it was working. Now it's not working. I don't know what's wrong. Um, and one of the challenges is that there isn't really, we've kind of solved this by splitting up the IRC, but one of the big problems is that there's not a place to plug yourself in as a generation two indie web person while feeling comfortable, right? So one of the big problems is that there, I don't feel like there's other people that are kind of at the level I am. And I also know that everybody that builds this stuff is doing it in their free time. So I don't necessarily feel like there's a support that I can just sort of query and go, oh, hey, can you help me? I don't know why my if thing is broken. Um, which comes to my second last point, which is that there is an unnerving reliance on people's side projects. <laughs> so one of the IndieWeb principles is build for yourself, which I have done, but almost all of those are based on things that other people have built. It's hard, you know, as someone who runs my business website off WordPress, I generally look for themes and plugins that people are getting paid to build because I have an idea that they're going to continue longer. One of the kind of scary things about IndieWeb is that I'm relying on the good graces of generation one to continue to be excited about this to use it. Um, current documentation for any web stuff requires a fair amount of work to find. The wiki is not the most beautiful place in the world. Um, and because of that, it can be really challenging to kind of come in as someone who, um, I wouldn't describe myself as non-technical, but a non-developer and feel immediately comfortable being walked through the steps for this stuff. Um, there are a lot of problems, and I think this is one of the big turnoffs for a lot of possible Generation 2 folks. You have a lot of problems with Facebook algorithms if you posse, which essentially means that if you post from your own website, it is less likely to show up in people's, um, in people's feeds. So I get a lot more responses when I post things natively on Facebook than I do from my own website. Um, one of the other problems is that all my posts, if I want to use Bridgie and use Snap, have to be public on my Facebook. I'm personally fine with this, but a lot of my commenters don't want to necessarily comment on my posts when it's public because they know it's going to go back to the internet. I don't know what they really think Facebook is private. But, um, but this is one of the problems, is that it can be hard to create something that is a private view when you're using indie web technologies. And last and probably most of all is that I don't really feel like I can evangelize effectively, and that's because there isn't a good marketing funnel to kind of put people in. I know a ton of people that would benefit from indie web technologies, a lot of artists, a lot of folks that uh, are getting pushed off of silo due to, silos due to algorithms that could really, really benefit from indie web technologies. But right now, I don't feel like there's a good place to plug them in without hand-holding them through setting up a WordPress website. So I think indie web has a huge potential for artists. And um, as many of you know, this is particularly due to the real name policy that is pushing off drag queens and trans folks and artists, and because of monetization issues. So as the algorithms change to try to, you know, make these all of these social networks actually profitable, um, the, it makes it harder and harder to monetize your own work and your own content creation, which is really challenging if you're trying to make your living on the internet as an artist. Um, and one of the big problems is that you're completely at the whims of these companies in the silos. There's so much potential for people being able to host their own archives on their own websites. There are so many Generation 2 people that are completely comfortable setting up a domain that could be benefiting from IndieWeb. They could be pulling the comments back in. They could know that the content that they've created as a really awesome drag queen isn't going to disappear when Facebook decides that, you know, Miss Baby Cakes is not a real name. So there's a huge amount of potential. So my question is, how do we get from Gen 2 to Gen 3? That's it. <laughs>